so to recap um, what Valerie said, I think um, with regards to the gene replacement question, one of the reasons, I just wanted to add one thing, one of the reasons that we're interested in that uh, for therapeutic purposes is because, as you know, there are many mutations uh, in the patient population and addressing those through a gene editing approach requires us to address each of the individual mutations one at a time, whereas a gene replacement approach might be something that we could get to an endpoint faster. Um, and of course, I think that's everybody's concern in the room is how do we get there as quickly as possible? So that's one of the reasons. Um, and with respect to the model, um, like Dr. Willis, we also are working on animal models for the disease. And uh, we're interested in polar 3D uh, models because as you know, that is a large fraction of the mutations in the patient population as well. So. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you okay, hear me? Great. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Good stuff. So I'm going to jump in here. Um, some questions that we're all interested in. Why are we here, right? How long is it going to take to develop a therapy for 4 H leukodystrophy? How does drug development work? How realistic is a therapy? What kinds of research are we trying to accelerate? And what kinds of drugs are we working on? So we're all here today, including me, with questions like these. And uh, so my name is Max Michael Robinson, and I'm joined today by Steph Perrier. And uh, we work for Dr. Genevieve Bernard in the Miley Neurogene Laboratory in Montreal, Quebec. And we study polar three related hypomyelinating leukodystrophy, or 4H. And uh, we wanted to discuss some of our thinking around the therapeutic approach to the disease. So we're aiming today to give you an overview of the drug development process and some of um, what I think at this point should be called major ongoing discussions uh, in the field. And we want to talk about the kinds of research that we're working on and some of the treatments that are being considered for 4-H by ourselves and others, um, including both gene and cell-based therapies, which are areas of interest for our lab. And I think one of the themes of the talk over this last couple of days have been that we don't necessarily have concrete answers to all of these questions yet. Um, so we're just trying to open up a discussion about where things are going. And uh, so feel free to chime in if you have questions, we'd love to answer them. So let's talk about the path to therapy development. What does drug development look like? And what kinds of questions are we trying to answer at each of the individual stages of drug development? So there are four stages to drug development. We have discovery and development, preclinical studies, clinical development, and post-marketing studies. Discovery and development is the earliest phase of research. And here we're concerned with really asking fundamental questions about how a disease works so that we can better understand how we could try and treat it. We might ask questions about mechanisms of disease, drug targets, or pathology. And in order to answer those questions, we develop models that allow us to study them in detail. And once we have models, we can also propose and test candidate drugs, which is something that we're trying to do. So the models we use come in two flavors. We have in vivo models where we study disease biology in a live animal. Sometimes we use a mouse, most commonly, uh, but there are other animals as well. Uh, and in vitro, and that's where we use cells in a dish to try to study disease models as well. The next stage of research is called preclinical studies. And you may hear the, team, the term preclinical used loosely to describe kind of any research that comes before the clinical trial phase, um, but it actually refers to a set of experiments that we use to develop a clinical trials application. And uh, in that particular instance, uh, we have to use, usually have to follow some regulatory standards to carry out those studies. So in that case, uh, we're, what we're really doing is we're testing a candidate drug in our most useful disease models, and we're trying to figure out if we should proceed to clinical trials. So here, we're collecting data on a number of different outcomes, um, but two of the most important ones to fact, that factor into the decision about whether or not to proceed to trials are, are dosing and toxicity data. And as you can imagine, if you're uh, in the shoes of a clinician, when you're starting a clinical trial, you need to know how to dose a drug and you need to know how safe it, it looks, right? Those are two very important factors. Um, clinical development is how we refer to the collection of clinical trials that are used to get a candidate approved um, and really approved for use outside of the trial environment. 
So getting to this stage of research is a huge milestone, uh, and it's arguably the most challenging of them all to complete. So here we want to determine if a drug is both safe and effective. And traditionally, uh, clinical trials are split into three phases. And the first phases, sometimes uh, for phase one and two, are, are condensed together. And we're asking questions about uh, both of those phases at the same time. Um, and the other important thing to realize is that uh, oftentimes extensions can be added on to these different phases that prolong studies for additional years if uh, there's reason to do that. So clinical trials are designed to ask progressively harder questions about how useful a drug is in order to know if it should be approved. Six to 10% of candidate drugs are successful through all phases of clinical trials. And these numbers are sort of a rough guideline because it does vary a little bit from disease to disease. Um, <clears throat> And the process is, is very highly regulated. So, I mean, you know about the FDA. We also have Health Canada. There are regulatory bodies in Europe and Japan. Um, and, you know, these trials need to be regulated very heavily in, in order to ensure that they're conducted safely and that the data that we have is high quality. Once a drug is approved, we continue to do post-marketing studies. And there's a number of really good reasons to do this. Um, the biggest one is probably that we want to continue to monitor adverse events and safety after a drug's been approved. Um, but we may also be interested in trying to learn more about how a drug works, how effective it really is, and whether we can improve it or design a better one. So uh, in order to describe kind of how our questions evolve throughout this drug development process, I wanted to pick on a science project that a lot of you would be more familiar with. Uh, so I picked the space race. Okay, so the space race uh, took place over about a decade, starting in the 50s and throughout the 60s. And the big question was, can we land on the moon, right? It was a big question at the time. And you'll notice that when you, <laughs> when you start a, something like this, that's not the first question that you ask. So the first question that NASA asked was, uh, can we put a person in space? And that was called Project Mercury. And that's NASA's discovery and development project. So, uh, they sent 20 unmanned vehicles into space during that project, and they even sent two chimps named Ham and Enos into orbit before they sent six human pilots. And then they moved to Project Gemini, and there they're stepping up the question a little bit. So they're trying to prove that they have the techniques to land on the moon. It's NASA's preclinical study, right? And they're asking, would the techniques that we have work for a moon landing? So in total, Gemini launches two unmanned rockets and 10 crew flights. You notice that they're stepping up the question, but they're also committing more heavily to the technique. Most of the rockets are crewed at this point. The rockets are bigger, uh, and they're testing out these techniques to try to work on a moon landing. So they prove that important things like spacewalks, rendezvous, docking, these are all possible in space. And at that point, things are picking up speed. But the one that everybody knows is Apollo. And you know the answer, or you know the, uh, the rest of the story, there's footprints on the moon. So despite the odds and the incredible resources that this takes, it is possible to do incredible things. You may know less about NASA's post-marketing studies that's called Skylab. Skylab was instrumental in understanding long-term spaceflight. And ultimately, the research that was done set the stage for the International Space Station, the ISS that we have today. So I hope I'm painting like a more pic visual picture here of how our questions evolve throughout this process, right? And how the complexity and the resources required to answer these questions get stepped up at every phase as we move through the process. In the spirit of that analogy, I'm asking the question, are new drugs a moonshot? How realistic is it that we're able to produce a therapy for 4-H? So firstly, we need to know that like developing drugs uh, and sending rockets to the moon, these types of projects take a long time. Half of all drugs approved between 2010 and 2020 spent longer in clinical development than the Apollo program took from the very beginning to when they landed on the moon. What's even more important here to remember is that the preceding programs uh, that NASA uh, pursued took a total of 10 years to complete. What that means for our understanding of drug development and the analogy that I'm trying to pursue here is that uh, getting to clinical trials can take even longer than the trials themselves. The process of discovery is not trivial. On the other hand, it's also important to keep in mind in the world of science, that this is something that's done regularly. It's something that will continue to be done in the future, and we might even get better at it. We just can't predict how long it's gonna take 
for a new drug to enter trials. And it's especially difficult to make an educated guess because the research that occurs leading up to trials isn't necessarily tracked the same way that trials research is. Optimistically, I think though, rare disease research is growing. So orphan drugs are drugs that show promise for diseases that affect less than 200,000 people. And the data shows that since the 1980s, orphan drugs, the number of orphan drugs being developed has doubled every decade. And with the help of groups like Yaya, we hope that to be the case for uh, 4-H as well. So more people working on rare diseases is important and is optimistic for all of us. We hope that it's gonna mean an increased chance of a successful discovery and development effort. And we also hope that it's gonna enhance our ability to conduct trials in a way that's more in line with the specific challenges inherent to developing drugs for rare disease. So in summary, there are four stages of drug development. We can't predict how long it's gonna to take to bring a new drug into clinical trials and success in trials is never guaranteed, but there is more activity in the space than ever. And we believe it's possible and we're working on it. So I'm gonna pass it to Steph. Great, thanks. Um, so next slide. So now that we know uh, that we've reviewed the process of drug development, we can discuss therapy approaches in the context of 4-H leukodystrophy. Next slide. Um, from studies of large cohorts of patients, um, as you know, we know that the four uh, common cardinal clinical features associated with 4-H leukodystrophy are hypomyelination of the brain, which leads to neurologic dysfunction, um, dental problems are involved, and endocrinology and growth abnormalities. Um, and when we're looking at a therapy, we're looking at um, improving the neurodegeneration of the brain, so focusing in on the hypomyelination feature. Next slide. Um, so before we can proceed with developing therapies, we have to gather more information about these features and how they progress over time in order to form a more full picture of the disease and how it evolves so that we can know how to treat it. And um, as Dr. Wolf and Dr. Bernard both talked about, um, this can be accomplished using natural history studies of the disease, um, similar to also how the IIF Foundation spoke about it. Um, so natural history studies are epidemiological studies that aim to collect information about a disease from a large group of patients so that we can identify the most common symptoms um, and see how the disease evolves uh, and also how often patients have mutations in specific genes. So the POL3 genes, polar 3 a 3B, 3K, and 1C. Um, so this helps us form that full picture of the disease from the first diagnosis to the later stages of the disease. Um, it helps us to identify biomarkers as well, which doctors can use to measure the stage of the disease and whether or not a therapy is working or not. So we can study genetic diseases in the lab using different kinds of representative models, like mouse models or cell models, um, like Dr. Willis spoke about before, mouse models. Next slide. So um, we can use mice to study human diseases because they can be genetically manipulated to mimic a disease or condition. Um, so for example, in 4-H leukodystrophy, uh, researchers like Dr. Ian Willis's group have created a mouse model to explore how mutations in polar 3A can impact brain development, while we're working on a model for polar 3B. Um, so these models help us test therapies. They help us understand the biology of the disease and study myelination um, in a biologically relevant context. So we can also use cell models to study rare diseases, uh, and this can be accomplished by, for example, collecting blood or skin cells from patients, growing them in a dish in the lab uh, under different conditions. And using a specific method, we can uh, use different growth conditions to change those patient cells into stem cells. Um, and stem cells are just a type of cell that have the ability to turn into different cells. So you can see on the diagram here, once we revert them back to stem cells, they can change into neural cells or blood cells or pancreas cells. In this case, we're interested in studying the neural cells. Um, and it's especially important uh, to use stem cells, induced pluripotent stem cells is what they're called, um, to study brain diseases because we normally can't study human brain cells without collecting them directly, which isn't possible to do. We can't perform um, a biopsy to, to collect patient cells because it's very invasive. Um, so we can use these patient uh, brain cells uh, 
that have been derived from stem cells in order to test also whether certain drugs will work in correcting their dysfunction. Um, so this is called drug screening and it's very efficient using, um, using these cells in the lab because we can look at many different types of drugs, including some that have already been FDA approved and test them at the same time. So it makes the workflow uh, a lot uh, very efficient once we know what we're looking for and whether it can be improved or not. So I'm gonna, um, next slide, sorry, there's one more. Um, so now we're gonna move on to discuss the different therapeutic approaches for 4-H given what we have studied and also what has been trialed in other leukodystrophies and other rare genetic diseases. So Mac, it will take over now. Thanks, Steph. Um, so now that you understand a little bit more about the research approaches that we're taking to answer questions about 4-H, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the therapies that might be promising. Um, but first, we need to review a little bit about the basics of genetic disease. So as you know, genes are DNA instructions for cells. And your genes are kept as part of chromosomes inside the nucleus of every cell in your body with the exception of red blood cells and platelets. <laughs> uh, so proteins carry out low level functions in cells and your cells put together the functions of these proteins in order to accomplish sort of higher level things. And um, so they're like the building blocks of cell function. And your genome carries instructions for how to make proteins. So um, in order to do this, the cell copies its DNA as an RNA method and it sends that to the protein synthesis machinery to make a protein. That machinery is called the ribosome and there are a lot of other associated factors there, but the message is brought to the ribosome and the ribosome is able to, with the help of tRNA, interpret the code to make a protein. Um, because the correct synthesis of the protein depends on the DNA sequence, when you have DNA mutations, it can cause dysfunctional proteins by changing the way that those proteins are made. And so ultimately that can sort of filter up and cause defects in cell function. And ultimately it can lead to disease. Now the process I described of copying DNA into RNA and using those instructions to make proteins is called the central dogma of biology. And luckily we have therapeutic tools that we can use to try to correct cell functions at different levels of this process. And we're hoping that that's going to allow us to improve or correct cell function in the context of 4-H. So some of the ideas, and really this is sort of the landscape that we're working in right now. Um, but again, these are ideas. This is the earliest phase possible of research. These are discussions at this point. And some things we've made some progress on and other things have yet to be tried. So this is really sort of my brainstorm slides, OK? Um, so there is gene therapy where we would add healthy copies of pull three genes to cells. Uh, there is cell therapy where you might replace defective cells in the brain and try to promote myelination with uh, new cells that have been replaced. Um, you could use small molecules to maximize the function of the existing pull three. You might try using RNA therapy to help produce healthy pull three in the brain. Um, or you could use antisense oligonucleotides to help avoid splicing errors in, this, in the case of specific known mutations. So, as I say, ongoing discussions, but still very early days. So let's talk a little bit about uh, gene-based therapies and what that means and what they are. In order to understand gene therapies, we need to understand how they're designed. So the first distinction when we uh, administer a therapy is whether or not we're going to administer the therapy to the patient or to the patient's cells. So in vivo gene therapy is where we administer the therapy to the patient in the body. And ex vivo gene therapy is where we extract some cells from the body, we treat those cells in a dish, and then we re-administer them back to the patient correctly. So in the case of um, in vivo gene therapy, that's done when the affected tissues in the disease are hard to access, and that includes the CNS or the brain, Whereas ex vivo gene therapy is done in similar situations to where you could use a bone marrow transplant. Um, and that includes blood and metabolic disorders as well as a handful of leukodystrophies. But in the case of 4-H, it's probably going to require an in vivo approach because we need to directly target cells that are in the brain and can't be removed. 
The next thing that differentiates uh, therapies from one another is the method we use to get the gene therapy inside the cell. So you've heard from Guangping Gao and, and Dr. Uh, Jun Shi, and um, there are different viral tools that we can use to do this, and they're matched to the use case that we're developing for. So in vivo gene therapy has specific viruses that work well for that. Ex vivo has specific viruses that work well for that. Um, we use viruses because they're especially good at getting inside cells. They're evolved to do that. But we engineer them, as has been alluded to, uh, in order to remove viral genes so that the viruses can't replicate and spread inside the body. So what they are is little de delivery vehicles. We're delivering a therapeutic gene to the cell, and we're taking advantage of the virus for, that, uh, for its ability to take the therapeutic gene and get it into the cell and get it into the nucleus. Um, and as I said before, you really have to match the virus that you're using to the situation that you're trying to develop a drug for. Um, so again, it has to be matched to in vivo or ex vivo use cases. Uh, but because these viruses have strengths and limitations like any other drug, um, it also has to be well matched to the disease. The whole design holistically has to fit what you're trying to do. Um, so it's very important that we test these viruses in our models, not just for their ability, uh, not just for the proof of concept for the therapy, but also for the proof of concept that the virus is well matched for the purpose that we're trying to use it for. Um, the gene therapy mechanism of action uh, and the way that it works inside cells is another fundamental part of designing a therapy. So two common mechanisms are gene addition and gene editing. Um, and you've heard of a couple other ones. In this case, I'm using gene addition to mean the same thing that uh, Jin Shi meant by gene replacement. So what we're doing is we're adding a copy of a therapeutic gene, a normal, healthy, functioning gene, to cells that have um, the mutated copies in them. We're not replacing the copies that exist within the cells. Uh, in gene editing, what you're doing is you're adding um, genetic material, as well as oftentimes an enzyme. So you may have heard of CRISPR-Cas9. And what that's accomplishing is it's allowing CRISPR-Cas9 to try to make repairs at the specific site where the mutation exists. So what does uh, what would a 4-H gene therapy look like? So again, this is an idea that's garnered interest. It's something that we're currently interested in working on. Oh, no problem. No, no problem. Okay, um, so we left off at uh, what would a 4-H gene therapy look like? And the short answer to that is that it's a little bit too early to tell all of the details. Um, it's most likely that if a gene therapy idea is feasible, that it's gonna be an in vivo approach, as I alluded to before, and it's likely to require the use of a viral vector. So um, probably adeno-associated virus because of its specific strengths in the context of in vivo gene therapy. And uh, it's also, I think, a strength that that's been studied in a handful of other leukodystrophies and it's being used now in, in a number of uh, different trials for different diseases as well. So we know a lot about how AAV um, works inside the body in a clinical context. We're still answering fundamental questions about the feasibility of this approach for 4-H. Um, so I think Jin Shi and, uh, and Guangping Gao alluded to the fact that we need to know, for instance, about the ability of the AAV capsid that we choose to target the cells of interest in the brain, in this case, uh, cells in the oligodendrocyte lineage, the cells that make myelin. Um, 
And so to this end, we've developed a mouse model of 4-H, uh, the Polar 3D model that we have now. And we intend to use this to test the gene therapy approach um, and potentially other approaches for treating 4-H leukodystrophy as well. And that work is currently underway. Um, so I'm going to transfer over to, uh, to Steph for her slides about cell therapy. Go ahead, Steph. So we'll now discuss another type of therapy called cell-based therapies. So in the brain, we know that the white matter is a complex tissue. Um, it's composed of many different cell types, um, as illustrated in this image. Next slide. So um, in the white matter, myelin is formed around neurons by cells called oligodendrocytes. Uh, in 4-H leukodystrophy, we know that myelination doesn't happen properly during development. And studies of brain tissue have shown that it's a complex disease, but we know that there's a loss of these oligodendrocytes that are available to make the myelin. So because the oligodendrocytes don't work properly to provide support to neurons, uh, later on in the disease, parts of the neurons can also start to break down, leading to neurodegeneration. So if the oligodendrocytes can't myelinate properly, it's been explored um, in other cell types, whether they can be uh, directly replaced by healthy cells from other sources. Um, because the oligodendrocytes are at a final stage and don't replicate, researchers have to explore whether precursor cells or cells that can turn into oligodendrocytes with time can be delivered to form the myelin properly. So in many studies of mice, um, researchers have shown for other diseases that delivering these pre-oligodendrocyte cells to the brain is successful in forming myelin. So this can be done by injecting these cells directly into the brain of the mouse and seeing if the myelin can form properly after a period of time. So this has been shown in other studies of leukodystrophies like plesius mersbacher disease, which is another hypomyelinating leukodystrophy. Next slide. Um, so along these lines, a phase one clinical trial had been completed in patients with plesius mersbacher disease, uh, again, another type of hypomelanating leukodystrophy. And in this case, brain cells were injected into patient brains through four small holes in the skull, and patients were monitored over the course of five years. Um, so the primary goal of this clinical trial was to figure out whether it was safe and whether it caused any unwanted effects. So after five years, the procedure was found to be um, well tolerated and no patients had formation of tumors, um, but two had an immune response. And in terms of looking at remyelination um, and whether the therapy was working to improve the patient condition, there was less evidence that this was the case because they only saw very small changes in MRI at the injection sites and there was only very little, little clinical improvement in the patient's conditions. Um, so because this clinical trial was only done to assess the safety profile, the primary goal was met, but it still needs to be improved before it can be tried again as a therapy to see if it can work to improve clinical features. So even though some therapies can be successful in animal models like mouse models, it's important to remember that there are a lot of steps before they can be trialed in humans. And it's often difficult to translate results to humans when studying neurological disease therapies because mouse brains are a lot different than human brains in different ways. Um, so first, they're a lot smaller than human brains. Um, as you can see in the figure there, they're very tiny compared to our brain, as you, as you know. Um, and they also have a lot less white matter. So you can see why it would be less effective to try to transplant, transplant cells into the human brain compared to the mouse brain because it's so much larger with more white matter that has to be repaired and myelinated. And also mouse brains develop at a much faster rate than human brains. Um, and while this is helpful when we study mouse brains in the lab, because we can see uh, whether therapies can work on a much faster timeline, it takes a lot longer to translate that to humans to see if it uh, works over a period of time. So that means that it takes a lot longer to develop these therapies to the point where they could be used to effectively um, in, in, uh, in human diseases. So in summary, we talked today about uh, both cell therapies and gene therapies in the context of 4-H leukodystrophies and which would be the most effective to consider studying in the lab 
based on what has been shown in other types of leukodystrophies and rare diseases. And if you're interested in reading more information and scientific detail about these therapies, uh, we recently published a review paper with a reference at the bottom of the slide where we discussed different um, studies that showed results. And I'll let Mac finish with this slide here. Okay, so takeaways from today's talk. Um, the therapy development occurs in, in phases, and we're still in the very earliest phase of research for 4-H in terms of therapeutics development. Um, I think it's optimistic that there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of interest in this space, and we have partners like Yaya to help with this. Um, and as Dr. Willis alluded to before, we're also leveraging uh, you know decades of research on poultry, which is helpful to understand what it is that we're dealing with here. Um, another takeaway is that not all types of treatments are useful for all diseases, and that is doubly true for leukodystrophies. These are uh, different diseases, um, and so we need to consider that success in, on one front does not mean success on all fronts all the time. Um, as I said, we're still in an early phase, and I would like to take this opportunity to bring up that uh, we've developed a, a brochure, and that brochure, the purpose of it is to try to help with um, conveying some information about these novel therapies. Um, so we have information about in vivo and ex vivo gene therapy. We have information about ASOs. We also have information for other leukodystrophies. So we have information about enzyme replacement therapy as well. Um, this is very new and I'm still in the phase of collecting feedback and we're trying to finalize things like illustrations and uh, get this translated into multiple languages and things like that. So if there's anybody in the room uh, or online that is interested in helping us with this, wants to take a look, provide feedback, um, I would really appreciate that. It would be super helpful to us um, so that we can get this done. And we'll try to provide that to the community through various channels like the ULF and Yaya um, in the near future. So thank you for your attention. And uh, thank you to, uh, to Ron and, and Valerie and, uh, and Shannon and Christina for uh, all their support and having us here to, uh, to speak with you today. Okay, so the question is, has myelin been reproduced in the lab? And my, my question back to you would be, um, in what sense? Artificial myelin or, because my, my mice grow myelin every day. Okay, that's a fantastic question. So I think what you're getting at, and that really gets to the heart of what myelin is. So what myelin is, is it is, it's a component of cells. So cells are produced in the brain during early development and they're produced sort of at the top end of the spinal cord, like in the brain stem, okay? And those cells populate the brain during early life and they migrate to sites where they're needed to myelinate axons and they extend processes. And those processes wrap around axons and ensheath them. So myelin is both a living structure and a highly organized structure. So what we can do in the lab is we can do things like we can extract myelin from a mouse or even from human tissue, and we can work with it to study things like um, immune responses to myelin, for instance, in the context of MS. But uh, developing an artificial myelin substrate to put into a patient wouldn't work because what we need the myelin to, we need the myelin to be alive. And that's what's difficult. And that's what Steph, I think, was alluding to about using precursors in a cell therapy approach is that in that sense, what we would be doing is we would be giving the cells that would have myelinated the brain early in development. So we would try to recreate that developmental stage for those cells. We would implant those cells in the brain and they would go and hopefully myelinate axons. And that's what they were trying to do in the phase one study with the PMD. Um, but again, the interpretation of the effectiveness of that approach for the PMD study is complicated by the fact that they're really in phase one. And that was a, they were looking at safety outcomes more than the effectiveness of the, of the approach. 
So the micro environment, sorry, yes. So the question was about the micro environment and I, I'm gonna try to paraphrase uh, the micro environment of myelination. So the idea that uh, in order to promote myelination in the context of say 4-H or another leukodystrophy, uh, we need cells to get to the correct location. They need to exist in a certain kind of micro environment that facilitates myelination and we need them to additionally myelinate uh, axons. Um, that is a, a very interesting concept and a, and a difficult thing to address on a, on a broad level. Uh, different diseases promote different micro environments within tissue, and some of those micro environments are, um, in the context of disease, uh, they're not permissive to myelination. So uh, certainly that can be in the case, that can be the case in, uh, in MS lesions, uh, that can be the case in, in other diseases as well. I think. Um, I'm trying to uh, remember, but uh, I think it was it was one of the EIF um, one of the EIF talks, and they had um, increases in precursors that they saw in, in tissue that was uh, affected in the disease. So what that might reflect, for instance, is cells that are accumulating in a tissue that cannot go on to differentiate. Um, and I think in Dr. Willis's mouse model, they've seen issues with differentiation, and in cell models as well, that's the case. So the micro environment is certainly a factor and a challenge for promoting myelination in the context of, uh, of hypomyelination or in remyelination studies. Um, but again, the landscape is very complicated because each of these individual diseases has different considerations for what that micro environment looks like. Does that kind of answer your question? Okay. Okay. So Yeah. Okay. So to recap, uh, the question uh, is essentially, and again, I'm paraphrasing, but uh, is it a fair statement to say that the natural history study is uh, sort of the core factor that we need to address in the field? Um, and can we move forward without it? I think that, um, I think no. I think the natural history is something that uh, that needs to be done. It's something that I think a lot of people in this room and, and you know key stakeholders and stuff are interested in working on. Um, Dr. Bernard may be able to speak to this more, but uh, from my perspective, if I take a step back from my research niche uh, and look at the whole field, I completely agree with you. Without knowing how patients evolve over time, it should be nearly impossible for us to design trials. We need to know how patients evolve over time in order to ask questions about how we would help them improve um, in a disease that occurs over many years. So you're absolutely right. And Dr. Bernard, I'm not sure if you want to add, add to that. You might have stepped out. No, no, I'm here. Um, so no, I don't have anything to add. You did an amazing job answering the question, Max. Okay, great.
what do we know so far is something that I think Dr. Bernard or, or Dr. Wolf would have uh, better. I, I'm, not a, I'm not a clinical expert, so I don't know. Uh, I'm not as familiar with that data as the research data. What I can say is that you're right. There is a, there is a substantial amount of variability within the patient population. And um, we do talk about, for instance, within our group, the, uh, the idea that personalized therapies or more personalized therapies may become available. But I think that one of the things about that is that at the current time, that might not be the fastest way to get to a treatment for 4-H. And so again, what we're doing is we're weighing what we think has um, the most potential in the space to move the fastest, that has a reasonable scientific basis, things like that. Um, and, that's, and that's what we're trying to focus on in the near term to try to make advances. Um, and Dr. Bernard, do you want to talk about uh, age or, or ethnicity in terms of um, how, how that might differ between patients? I'm not sure I heard the question. Sorry, can you repeat it? The, the question was about how factors like age or ethnicity might impact, um, you know, the evolution of disease. Yeah, I, so... I think that we, uh, we, if we classify the disorder by age of onset, um, the patients with a very early onset disease typically um, uh, would, like, I mean, very onset, like two months, three months of age, which would, which probably would be qualified as their like early infantile, if you want, or uh, there's even some neonatal form. These patients will evolve much faster than the other patients. Um, when, so the typical patients present as, as toddlers, uh, and I guess the evolution varies according to um, many things, but the mutated genes play a role that we know. And the later onset patients are presents more with the cognitive and uh, behavioral um, manifestations often will remain stable for their motor development for several years um, before they start developing um, uh, motor features. I um, And then there are all of the other forms that Dr. Wolf talked about, the patients with no liquid dystrophy, the patients that present with um, uh, only with ataxia, only with spasticity. There are even patients that present only with bone disease or uh, bone disease and ataxia, for example. So the, the variability is very, um, is very wide, and that's why we absolutely need to study it. And um, um, regarding ethnicity, I don't think that we know uh, whether or not it has an impact on, on disease progression. Uh, we know that some um, population have mutations in mutation in such certain genes are more common in certain population. And we know, for example, in Quebec, we have a founder mutations for PAR3A. So all French Canadian patients from Quebec at least carry one mutation, one copy of this specific mutation, but we don't know how it relates to disease progression. I hope that answered the question. Yes, it's also the Okay, so the follow-up question, Dr. Bernard, is are we thinking that um, in terms of the therapies that we're developing, if they're going to, if we're going to try to make them available to all patients, or if they would be more appropriate for a subset like uh, children under five? Oh, Dr. Bernard, you're on, uh, you're on mute, I believe. Thank you. Sorry about that. Uh, so I think that's a very good question. We... Um, the, I, so we we want to develop therapies for for all patients. Um, we don't know whether or not they will be benefiting all patients. Um, we um, there's a difference between um, when it's commercialized versus when it's tested. Um, when it's tested with patient to with, with the patient population, it's very important early on if you want to assess efficacy to to um, include the right patients. So for example, if you include um, a very um, a patient that presents uh, in adulthood and that has a very mild uh, presentation and, and course of disease, if you give them therapy, you probably won't see an effect 
unless because you you would have to do a, a trial for like 20 years or 15 years or something like that so and then no trials last for that long you kind of have to do a trial for like two years as usually um the time that that we have so that's the first thing and the other thing is if you have a patient that is very severely affected uh at the time you try the therapy um and damage in the brain as in the brain has already been done uh you the patient is more is less likely to benefit from therapy so you really have to pick the right patient population because one of the um worst thing that could happen is 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 that we would test a therapy that works but would not be able to demonstrate it because we didn't pick the right therapy but then once the therapy is available um there will probably be criteria um, put in place by different um, um, entities uh, providing these therapies or paying for these therapies. But the, the patient that will be allowed to get that therapy uh, will be, uh, the, 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 it will be including more patients. Uh, but the first thing we need to do is prove that the therapy that we develop work. And then, <clears throat> It's possible that there will be a combination of therapies, that it won't be only one therapy. Um, it's the case for other rare diseases where um, there is, um, we know that, for example, um, one therapy works, but then another therapy works better. But perhaps one day, both therapies will be combined and it will be even better. So it could be the same for 4 H or maybe more than one therapy. And there may be therapies that are, are um, specific to a subtype of disease. Uh, for example, if we know that um, we know that some patients have um, a, a mutation that is what we call a splice size variant, so it is close to the genetic material that that codes into a protein, but it's not there. Yet. It's not in there yet. So it, it's possible that if we if we use um, ASOs, which are small um, uh, pieces of our of um, of RNA, to 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 try to make this um, life site work better to produce normal protein, uh, we may improve the outcome of these patients. But of course, this type of very specific mutation uh, um, therapy will, will, won't, won't apply to anybody else but the patients that have this specific mutation. So the, the answer is complicated. I think I guess there's many different aspects of that answer, but I guess that these, these are the, the, some, of exa some examples, I guess. Is that, uh, do you have a follow-up to that? Okay. Okay, I think that's it. So thank you very much, everybody.